Job chapter 23, the trust test, gaining new perspective in the refinement process. So I wanna start by asking you a question. Have you experienced refinement recently? In my short life, I've realized that we're either in refinement, coming out of refinement, or heading towards it. I feel like that's just the same theme every single week, right? You're probably like, I'm sick of hearing that I'm in suffering, I'm coming out of suffering, or I'm heading towards suffering. I'm sorry, but that's just real life. And uh, as I was preparing this study, I was thinking about a, uh, something that happened in my life recently that, that really refined me. Can I tell you about it? So I was recently uh, working out at Lifetime Fitness. That's where I train. And the goal is to get four in a week. So I was trying to cram in this workout in between a couple meetings uh, a couple weeks ago. And I finished my workout. I was rushing out, got in the car, was heading to a meeting. I'm like, I'm going to get some Starbucks coffee. And I had to stop by the bank real quick. So I'm in the line at First National Bank about a couple minutes away from Lifetime Fitness. And I get a notification on my phone that says, you left your AirPods behind. Have you ever gotten that before? You're like frantically like, okay, where'd I put those? And I never know whether to trust it or not because there's been times where it's told me that I've left them behind, but they're just sitting in my coat pocket. I'm like, come on, Apple, you got it. You, you're giving your boy an anxiety attack. Come on now, if you go to the gym, you need your AirPods, don't you? So I pull up, find my, you know, Apple device or whatever, and I look it up, and it says it's at Lifetime. So I go back to Lifetime, frantically run to the locker room, and as I'm going to the locker room, I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot my water bottle, too. Hopefully that's in there as well. So I get in there, and I run to my spot where my locker was at. I'm like, I probably left it out, and there's my water bottle sitting there, but what do you think is, is, is missing? Yeah, the mayor pods are gone. Nobody wanted the Stanley water bottle, but they're like, them AirPods, I will take those gladly. Thank you very much. So I go to the front desk, and I'm having a conversation with them. Hey, did somebody turn them in? No, they didn't. Well, my, my, my device is saying that they're here, so I'm hitting buttons trying to get them to alert me, and nothing's happening. And so I leave a lifetime just frustrated. I'm the type of person, when I lose something, like, I want to find it right now. Is anybody with me? And so I just can't, I mean, it's just on my mind. I, I hop into this meeting. I'm having a coaching call. I'm trying to invest in this executive leader over in the state of Iowa, and we're having a conversation, and all I can think about is these AirPods being gone. Where are they at? I need to find them. I'm like pulling my phone out in the middle of this call, like, where are they at? Still at Lifetime. Where are they at? 15 minutes later, still at Lifetime. Ooh, maybe somebody will turn them in, and I can go back there tomorrow and get them back. So I leave this meeting, and I have to pick up my son to take him to basketball practice. And so we go to basketball practice. I get him squared away. He's on the court. I'm sitting over on the side, and what am I doing? I'm checking my phone, like just refreshing that thing every five minutes. Where are these AirPods at? Finally, the location switched from Lifetime Fitness to 247. I won't finish the street because it might be your address. I'm like screenshotting that mug like, oh, man. Jesus done pulled me out of Egypt, but there's still some Egypt inside of me. I might just forsake my salvation for a moment. Yeesh. Let me run down on a kickoff one last time right through that front door. <laughs> so Judah finishes his practice, and we get in the car, and I'm like, you know what? I got the address. It's about three minutes away from my house. I'm going to drive by. I'm going to check this place out. Scope it out. Judah's like, where are we going, Dad? I'm like, don't worry about it, son. <laughs> so I drive by, and the lights are on, and there's a bunch of vehicles there. And I'm like, man, I should just go on up to the front door right now and confront whoever. My AirPods are in here. Look at the screenshot. Which one of y'all got them? I think it might have been the Spirit of God, but I felt like when I drove by the second time <laughs> and hit my brakes outside the house, something just came upon me like, hey, 
Your seven-year-old son is in the back seat. This could go sideways real quick. <laughs> Let's not add some trauma in his life. Just go on ahead and drive home and you come back here later by yourself. <laughs> I about called my friend Austin who's on the camera back there. Everybody waved to him. <laughs> I think I did text you like, hey man, come roll with me, man. <laughs> so I get home and I'm like, babe, look. I found where these AirPods are at. I'm gonna eat my dinner and then I'm going over there to get them. And it's so funny because in my house, and you guys are probably like, I don't believe this or buy this for a second. I'm, I'm usually like the graceful one and my wife is pretty like, she's justice. Some of y'all know Jerrica. It's like black and white with her, baby. And so I'm telling her what's going on, like hoping that she'll like feed my mission. Like, yeah. You go over there and get those AirPods. But she's not. And she's like washing the dishes and then she just kind of listened to me. She's not reacting the way I want her to. And I'm thinking, she's got a different thought about this than I do. And then the spirit started convicting me, especially when she opened her mouth and said, you know, um, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about when somebody slaps your cheek, turn your other cheek. When they take your shirt, give them your coat, too. I'm like, man, should I be driving over there and giving them my charger right now? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you're right. And internally, I'm like, this isn't what I want to hear right now. And then she went on to tell me a story about this pastor's wife who was dry, uh, drying some clothes in the backyard, and some of her clothes went missing, and then she showed up the next day at church, and there was a lady walking around the church in her pants. So what did she do? She went and got her matching jacket and gave it to the lady. I'm like, Jerrica, this ain't what I'm trying to hear right now. Uh, so I walked away. And I was like, okay, you're trying to refine me, aren't you, God? Come on, look to your neighbor and say, we need to pray for this pastor. <laughs> Here's what I got to say. Refinement is revealing. It's funny because, like, when I really step back and actually think about it, it's like, why are you getting so, like, riled up over some AirPods, dude? What? Like, you, like... You're, you're losing it. And in and, and that moment, it's like, it's like, I don't think God caused it to happen, but he allowed it to, and it revealed some things in me. And I just hope that you recognize through this silly little story is that we're all in refinement. God uses all sorts of different things in our lives to continue to uh, refine us and develop us. And, and there's something that God wants to do in us. There's transformation that continues to happen. We move from glory to glory. And this walk of life isn't peaches and rainbows, but God is always up to something. And I realized through this scenario that, man, it's uncomfortable to be refined. And it just made me reflect on this book of Job. I start thinking about his life and this journey. And some of you are new to the Bible, but this guy was a righteous man before God. He's like killing it. He's doing amazing things. And Satan comes to God and is basically like, hey, the only reason he's righteous, the only reason that he's really following you is because you've blessed him. And so God's like, well, you can go ahead and test him. And I can't quite wrap my mind around all that. But eventually, Job loses everything, enters into a season of suffering, and the guy continues to endure. He continues to understand that the refiner's fire that you and I often walk through wasn't punishment from God, but it was designed for purification. God was doing something special. He was maturing him. You know, many of us enter into these testing seasons, and we've been talking about a lot of them. Some of you have been through some incredibly difficult things. You've lost a child. You've lost a marriage. You've lost a job. I think about this last year for my wife and I. We've been 
going through a, a, a really intense season of refinement. She's had some health challenges, and here we are eight months into this thing, and I can just tell you in the midst of the pressure and in the midst of the testing, there are some days where we feel like we're passing the test, and there are some days where we feel like we're failing it. There are some days where I feel like I can stand in the trust test and stand my ground. There are days where I feel like I rebuke the lies. There are days where I feel like I cling to his truth. There are days where I feel like I lift up praise even when I don't know which direction to go. There are days where I feel like his word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. But there are days where I am overwhelmed and it feels like my feelings are in control. Have you been there? Have you been there? But here's what I've realized about life is some battles are meant to be conquered and some battles are meant to be endured. What good is it if we gain our ground if we can't stand our ground? This message today is all about being fortified. It's all about saying, God, I need you to change my mindset. We're moving from from this victim mentality to being victorious in Christ. We're not gonna agree with our feelings. We're gonna agree with the word of God. We're not gonna walk down our own path. We're gonna submit our lives to his path. Come on, because there's God's way, and then there's an easy way. And oftentimes, the easy way isn't God's way. Can anybody testify in here today? So I believe today in Job chapter 23, he gives us some keys he, he lets us into his world a little bit. And it starts off with his humanity. We're in the middle of Job, the middle of this test where he's going back and forth with his three friends. His three friends give a response and then Job gives a response. And what's interesting as we read this text, we start to realize that Job, it almost appears as if he's not even responding to his friends, but he starts talking to God. So look at what he says here in Job chapter 23. Starting in verse two, he says, my complaint today is still a bitter one and I try hard not to groan aloud. If only I knew where to find God. Skip down to verse eight, he says, I go east, but he's not there. I go west, but I cannot find him. I do not see him in the north for he is hidden. I look to the south, but he is concealed. And isn't this so true? You find yourself in this test, in this suffering, in this disappointment, in this failure, in this pain, and sometimes the question that comes into our mind is, God, have you forsaken me? Where are you? Where are you? I I don't see you. Where are you at in the midst of all of this? God, God, are you still with me? God, are you you still leading me? God, where are you? Have you left me? This is why we need to know the character of God. This is why we need to meditate on his truth. This is why we need to get who God is on the inside of us because the word declares that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And when the lie comes against you that God has left you, you can declare to the enemy that he's still leading you. And look at the transition here that Joe makes. He says this, but, what did Cap say last week? We, We like big bucks in the Bible, don't we? But he said this, but he knows where I'm going, declaration. And I I love this. And when he tests me, come on, say that with me. And when he tests me, I will come out as pure as gold. What a strong declaration. It's almost like Job is prophetically speaking over this test that Yes, I know I'm in a test, but I'm gonna come out as pure as gold. It's as if we're seeing him declare that this test is not punishment, but it's purification. And so the question that we ask is, can I trust God, that God is who he says he is? Can I trust 
that God is good in the midst of this test. And here we see Job declaring that he's gonna come out as pure as gold. I read this this week and I love this quote, but it says this, that gold doesn't fear the furnace because it knows that that it's gonna come out pure and brighter. So good, so good. And so the question we've gotta ask is, is how are you and I gonna come out of the test? Will we be able to declare that we are as pure as gold? I think the first point that I wanna leave with you today is that if we're gonna do that, we need to submit to his way. We need to submit to his way. Verse 11 says this, for I have stayed on God's paths. I have followed his ways and not turned aside. I don't know about you, but in the seasons of testing, when the pressure comes, sometimes staying on the narrow path seems like the hardest thing to do. Sometimes the next step forward is the hardest step to take, and do you find yourself today at a crossroads? See, see, I think in our culture, we haven't done a good enough job at setting people up with the reality of what we signed up to when we decided to, to turn from our sin and trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Because this isn't a playground, this is a battlefield. And yes, uh, the enemy came to kill, steal, and destroy, and God came to give you life and life to the full, but Jesus said, in this life, you will face trials. But be of good cheer, because I have overcome them. But so many come to God because they wanna change their behavior. Or they, or they want something from God. It's as if they treat him like a genie. But the reality is, is you and I are called to be submitted to his path, the narrow path. And right now, some of you find yourself at that crossroads where, man, that wide path that leads to destruction looks comfortable and it looks easy. But I'm here to declare today that if you will choose the narrow path, it will be worth it. It will be worth it. It's hard to do. It's easy to preach. It's hard to do. I remember a season of my life where I was at that place. I came here to Omaha, Nebraska in 2012. I was a young man that was pursuing a pro football career. And I'll be honest, those first couple of years, that was, it was tough to transition. And I remember I was uh, working a job with Stryker Medical, selling medical devices, and we happened to be in an OR uh, d- setting up a bunch of video platforms in the OR and it was this big installation and it was interesting because I was in a season where where I was starting to discover as much as I was thankful for this job and this career, I didn't foresee myself in it for the long haul. So I started to open myself up to, man, what what are some potential other opportunities that God might wanna bring into my life? And the, the secondary coach that I played for at Iowa State had just taken the job as defensive coordinator at Arkansas under Brett Bielema. So he called me when he got the job. This is while I was here in Omaha, was about six months in, and he said, hey, will you come down and be my defensive GA? I was like, hey, I'll pray about it for a couple of days and let you know. Well, a couple of days passed by, and I shot him a text saying, hey, I'm in, coach. He said, I'll call you on Friday when I get off the road recruiting. We'll square up the details, and then we can get going. He calls me on Friday. He says, hey, OC, um, sorry to break this news to you, but, but Brett had somebody else in mind for that particular role, and he's the head coach, so there's nothing I can really do about it. And it's so interesting because I remember later that week being in the OR, setting up these video platforms, and it just felt like I was at that place of confusion, where it feels like you're, you're being hard pressed on every side, have you ever been there? Maybe you can't relate to my particular season, but you've been there in your life, like you lose that job and you're just, man, you just feel like your back's against the wall or your marriage is crumbling and you don't know what to do and you just feel hard pressed on every side or you, you, you lose a child or a loved one and you're just like, I don't even know what to do and that's what I felt like. I was just in that moment, having a moment with Jesus in this back room and I said, God, This isn't what I want, but I submit to your plan. And it was hard to get there in my heart. 
But I truly believe that in that moment, that was a crossroads type moment where I could have walked away from the path and the plan that God had and I wouldn't be standing here before you today. I probably wouldn't be married to my wife with three beautiful children right now had I not come to that place of submission. Submission. We see here, Job can't quite understand why he's in this season. Some of us need to rest in the mystery of God. We're trying to figure it out, and this loop isn't closing, and it keeps us in this perpetual state of anxiety, trying to figure this situation out. What if we would just come to this place of submitting? Submitting. God, I don't understand, but I'm going to submit to your path. When we do this, there's a, there's a maturing that happens. There's a, there's a peace that's ushered in. There's a peace that's ushered in. If you and I are gonna endure, if we're gonna come out of the refiner's fire and not tap out, we need to submit to his way. Look to your neighbor and say, submit to his way. Submit to his way. Now, here's the deal. When you find yourself in these particular seasons, You've got to understand that when you're in a season of testing, you are the most vulnerable for the enemy to try to take you out. Why? Because he preys upon those that are in suffering because he can take the character of God and distort it in our minds. See, this, is, this has been the, the enemy does not have new tricks. Yeah, come on now. Exposed. Here, let me just expose him for you real quick. Let's go all the way back to the garden, Adam and Eve. What was, what was, what was the, the lie that he was, he was baiting them with? It was basically God is holding out on you. If you want the knowledge of good and evil, then you need to eat of this fruit. In other words, what he was doing is he was coming against the character of God. And that's what he does to you and I. So these lies are, are bombarding us and and. And whoever you feed is gonna lead and like you need to like really take inventory of what's coming in. Like what are, where are you getting your advice? Are you going to God or are you going to Google? <laughs> Come on, I think our Amazon Prime culture has, has perpetuated this desire in us for comfort. And so we, we run to all these different sources to hear what we wanna hear to justify the path that we're walking down when really what we need to turn to is the word of God. Hello, somebody. And so that's the second key here. If we're going to endure, we need to saturate in his word. Verse 12 says, I have not departed from his what? His commands, but have treasured his words more than daily food. So I think the question when we read this scripture here is we need to ask ourselves this question. What do I treasure? What do I treasure? Why is this so important that we ask this? Because you and I trust what we treasure. I think some of us are looking for God where he is not. I wrote this in my notes. If you treasure created things more than the creator, you will eventually be deceived. Anything you consume that makes you feel good about disobeying God's commands less is godless or from the enemy. I think we need to really consider what we treasure. You treasure in the doctor's report over his report? You treasure in what your mentor said about you more than what he says about you? Are you treasuring what your employees say more than what his word says? Jeremiah 15, six says this, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight for I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. Matthew 4, four says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Come on, somebody. We don't just need to eat daily food. We need some soul food. What did Cap say? There's not just a mental health crisis, there's a soul health crisis. And the only cure for that is the word of God, the sustenance that can come in and heal and comfort at a deep level. Can anybody testify to the power of the word of God at work within them? We just live in this world that's 
what's true for you is true for you. You good, like it's every, every, people are making up their own truth. And you wonder why people are out here not knowing who they are. So lost, so insecure, running to all these things that the world has to offer for their comfort, their satisfaction, and their fulfillment. And to me, it's just like what we read about in John 4, 4. It's like Jacob's well, the woman at the well, remember? Jesus said, you can drink from this well and you will come back thirsty tomorrow or you can drink from my well and never thirst again. Which well are we running into? What are we treasuring? What are we going to for sustenance? Because so many of us want a different outcome, but we're not willing to change our input. If you want a new outcome, you gotta change your inputs. What are you feeding on? What is your sustenance? We gotta let the word of God transform us. I wanna ask you a question, Christian. When's the last time you read the word of God and it convicted you? It it confronted your dysfunction. It made you uncomfortable. I'll just pass over that. It's like buffet Christianity, man. I'll pick the verses that make me feel good. But guess what? There's something powerful when we can allow the word of God. We can saturate in his word, and it causes our life to get in alignment with his will for our life. That's where the transformation happens. It's not enough to just know the word. The Bible says that if we hold fast to the word, then the truth will set us free. We've gotta meditate on this thing day and night. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind, Romans 12, two says. I love that word transformed, it means metamorphosis. Don't you love that the word of God may, if you will let it get on the inside, if you will meditate, you will look like a different person on the outside. Outwardly decaying, but inwardly being renewed day by day. Can anybody testify to putting their foundation in the source of God's word? Listen, if we're gonna endure church, this has to be part of our our Christian experience. It's, It's what we gotta turn to. It's what we need to be saturated and showered in. We need to cling to that thing. I was thinking about what Cap talked about last week, sacrificial praise. This idea of sacrificial praise I believe sacrificial praise is like in Mario Kart. It's like the boost. You know? Sacrificial praise. You know, okay. Gives you that momentary thrust forward. But you know what sustains you for the long haul? It's the word of God, baby. It is the word of God because it's living. And here's what the word of God does. The word of God reveals who God is and what he cares about. When he reveals who he is and what he cares about, it changes the way that we see ourselves in him. This is where transformation occurs. This is where we get to see who God created us to be and how he thinks about us and what he says about our lives. And I don't know about you, but there is great peace that comes when you stand in that place. That is how you stand your ground when you gain ground. It's in the word of God. It's anchored and tethered to what he says about how you, how you and I are to operate in the midst of these difficult seasons that we walk through. Now, for some of you that are in this place today, you're thinking, okay, that's great, um, the word. Um, I don't like to read that. I've tried that before. It's boring. And just, just bear with me for a second. I wanna challenge you in this. Because this, this book, this, this word, it's not just a historical document. It's not, it's not just um, a book full of words. I mean, this thing is alive. It's active. It has the, the ability to transform us from the inside out. But I believe the word of God is an acquired taste. Like it's, that's why we talk about, man, when we give the challenge of the word of God is it starts off as drudgery, then it becomes a discipline, and hopefully someday it actually becomes a delight. I mean, this reminds me of my experience uh, with coffee. (laughs) Well, that was a weird turn there, OC. Texas A&M, we're on the road. It's 2009, and I'm with my roommate, and he's like, dude, you've never had coffee? Like, you should try coffee. So we're on the road getting ready to play this game, and I had my first cup of coffee. 
I took my first drink. Just, I mean, you, this guy set it up like it's the best thing in the world. I took my first drink and I'm like, you like that bitter drink? That is nasty. Help me understand why I kept drinking coffee. And today I got my little Chemex out and I'm making two cups of coffee before I show up here to church. Now there's not a day that goes by where I don't drink coffee. It's an acquired taste. You and I, you and I, the things that we treasure, the things that we press into, that's what we run to. And here's the thing, just as much as it can be the word of God, that's how some of you have gotten to the place that you currently are in right now. You're in change, you're in bondage, and you didn't wanna be there. But it was one small step. It was one small step. It was one small step. And if that's where you find yourself today, I just believe this that as much as you wanna be free of the pornography addiction, as much as you wanna be free of the alcohol addiction, as much as you wanna be free of the, of, the, uh, of the emotional pain that you feel inside your heart, here's what I'm here to declare. A lot of those are symptoms to a deeper problem. God wants to heal your soul through the word of God at a deep level. He doesn't wanna just deal with the surface, he wants to get beneath the surface so that you can not just uh, make it through this season, but stay in this for the long haul. Do you believe it in this place today? Yeah. Some people go into the furnace. Some people go into the furnace and they get burned. Others go into the furnace and they get purified. What's the difference? When they cling to the word of God and to the will of God, that's when you get purified. When you don't, you get burned, and guess what happens when you get burned? You get bitter and you end up burning others. Hurt people hurt people. We gotta press into the word of God in this, in this hour and in this season if we're going to endure this season of testing. The final thing that I wanna leave us with is this. We see it in verse 14. We've gotta surrender to his will. I love this, like you're seeing, he's asking all these questions at the beginning of this text, and then he gets to 14, and he says, so he will do to me whatever he has planned. He controls my destiny. I love that language, he controls my destiny. You've heard it said that you can have control or growth, but you can't have both. Do I got any control freaks in the house today? Come on, yeah. Control freaks, throw them hands up, baby. Come on. Yeah, confession is happening right now. Yeah, some of you spouses were like, did you hear that? Can I lovingly tell you, stop trying to control, let go. As a matter of fact, I'll say this, you and I, we're in Christ, we're dead. <laughs> For I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. We need to surrender to his will if you and I are going to endure the test that we find ourselves in. I was recently having a conversation with a friend of mine who was the head strength and conditioning coach for the TCU men's basketball team. I was talking to him last spring and he's like, yo, OC, I'm kind of being stirred up to walk away from coaching and go be a missionary. Okay, brother, like, tell me more about it. Like, what's up? You know, I don't talk to him uh, as frequent as I probably should, but we were catching up and I was praying for him and he's like, hey, will you pray for me? I think on Friday I'm gonna go tell the head coach that I'm stepping down to go do this. And so he did it boldly and moved to Austin, Texas to go be a missionary on the campus there at, at Austin. And I hadn't talked to him since he made this move. And so I, he was on my heart this week. I reached out to him. I said, yo, Drew, like, how you doing, man? Like, what's good? Um, catch me up, give me an update. He said, hey man, I feel like I'm in a Job season. I'm like, what? Funny enough, we're studying Job. Like, here's the playlist. Go listen to all these sermons, man. Like, press in. And I'm teaching on Job this week. Like, what you, what, what's going on? What do you mean you're in a Job season? Like, what's, what's, what's the deal? He said, yeah, yeah, I moved to Austin, thought this whole like missionary thing was gonna work out and then it fell through and it didn't work out. And now I'm back in Fort Worth and I'm working three different jobs serving tables and fixing up homes. And it's like, in, in one year's time, he goes from 
a profession that's really hard to get into and he's at the top of his game. By the way, TCU right now is ranked in the top 10 in the country. Have a chance to go compete for a national championship and this man is humbled in Fort Worth, Texas working, working three jobs right now. I'm thinking, man, you're in a season of refinement. I'm like, dude, you're like, you're living the message that I'm preaching this weekend. And it was funny because before I even told him what I was preaching, he sent me this text message and just let this encourage you. He said, in past seasons, I would think stuff is going bad. I must be displeasing God. But now realizing he tests me to refine me. Like, Boy, you preaching my message. So I just obey and take up my cross, making the devil big mad while I obey my papa. It's like, yeah, come on, man. He's getting it. Come on, somebody. He's getting it. He's being fortified. He's experiencing a, a, a different mindset. And this season of testing is gonna become his testimony. I've said this many times. Oftentimes, we wanna put a period where God's putting a comma. He will take the pain that we experience and repurpose it for his purposes, but it requires us to lean in, to allow him to fortify us, to transform us. It, it, we gotta cooperate with his spirit in the midst of this, these refinement processes that we walk through, and Drew did it, and I'm so proud of him. Easy? No. Can God do it in us? Absolutely. I, uh, I just love how, how God works and I wanna give you some hope for this book because again, we're in the middle. The beauty with Job is we see the end. We know that he experiences restoration. We know that God restores to him double of what he had before. And here's the reality. Some of us have lost some things that we will never get back. I don't, I don't wanna over promise so and, and, and God like under delivers on, on your life. I want you to know that God is good and you may have lost something in your life and you may not get that thing back, but he could give you greater peace, greater joy, greater perspective. Can anybody testify to this? Is anybody thankful that our God redeems and restores and renews? And the things that the many enemy meant for evil, God will use for our good for God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. I wanna bring this story for full circle because it was silly and it was funny, but I, I got to the place with those AirPods where I'm like, let it go, let it go. There's no holding back. I, I just had to let them go. I had to let them go. And that was on a Thursday, three days later. Jesus cracked that grave three days later and resurrected. Three days later, I showed up to church on Sunday and I was in our director's meeting. How many of you know, how many of you are thankful for the volunteers that show up here first thing in the morning to make this thing happen? And I was encouraging them and I was talking about just sacrifice, this idea of sacrifice and how that particular week God invited me into this sacrifice that ultimately led to growth. Like I truly needed to let my pride go, let my ego go, let that, those AirPods go, like let that situation just go. Like I'm gonna have the situation, the situation is not gonna have me and that's how refinement goes. Either, either we overcome refinement or refinement overcomes us. And so I'm sharing this with our team and then about 15 minutes later we walk in here for tip time and Denise was sharing on being spirit-led. She was challenging us in this idea of being spirit-led. And she's like telling this story about how yesterday, so Saturday, she just felt like the spirit was telling her to buy these AirPods, but she's like wrestling with God. Like, why am I buying these AirPods? This makes no sense. Like, I think she said she might've even walked out of the store and then had to walk back in. You know, I always said this, God, there's, there's God's way and then there's our, our way, right? The easy way is oftentimes not God's way. So she surrendered and submitted to what God was putting on her heart. She shows up here on Sunday and she's like, yo, I think the AirPods are for you, OC. Come on now. I took those things and I said, I passed the test. I passed the test. Barely, barely. I had 
to phone a friend. Thank you, Jericho, for helping me pass the test. I share that with you because I just feel like, you know, my wife and I, we're in this bigger refinement season, but it was like this wink from God that, hey, I see you. And, and, and you think that I left you or you think I'm taking something from you. I'm trying to deposit something in you, a greater perspective a greater testimony so that you can continue to help people. This isn't just about your comfort. I'm doing something bigger here. And so often when you and I walk through these seasons, it causes us to get our eyes off of ourselves and off of the temporary and on the eternity, fixing our focus back on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So God, thank you. Thank you right now for the test. We're in the middle of it. We just declare, God, that you would be our strength and our portion. We submit to your will, we surrender to your path, and God, we saturate in your word. Would you fill us this week? I pray that you would encourage your people. I pray that today, Lord, we would just say, have your way in us so that you can continue to have your way through us. Let's go ahead and stand and I just wanna to speak to those of you in the room that maybe you've never come to that place of surrender. Speaking of surrender, thinking of submitting. I think of the moment in my friend's car back in 2007 in a Hollywood video parking lot where I made the decision to surrender and submit to God's plan for my life. Maybe your plan goes a little bit like mine, but I took the free gift that God had given me and I said, God, thank you for this free gift. I'm gonna go my own way and do my own thing. Appreciate you, I got it from here. And thought, word, and deed, I sinned against my creator. And this sin separated me from the relationship that he ultimately created me for. The same is true for you. Thought, word, and deed, you've sinned against your creator and it separates you from a holy God. And this pained God's heart so much that he sent his one and only son to bridge the gap for you and I. So Jesus came to planet Earth and went to the cross and paid our debt penalty on the cross. And when he was on that cross, he said to Telestai, it is finished. God didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. So if you're not in Christ, you're a dead man walking. And eternity doesn't look good right now, but I can tell you today, a transformation can happen. Your eternal address can change today. All you have to do is believe. You say, God, I acknowledge my sin and I turn from it today and I trust in your finished work on the cross. And the Bible says this, that anyone who is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So if you need that today, if you need forgiveness in the house of God, I want you to get out of your seat wherever you're at. You could be in the nosebleeds or right here in the front. As the band plays, make your way forward. I'd love to pray with you. You are good. You can only be left the 99 for the one. Yeah. This moment is for you. If you're joining us online, you can also be a part of this as well. Uh, but I want to lead you in this prayer. This is your heart connecting with God. It'd be my privilege to lead you in this. Say, Jesus, today I acknowledge my sin and I ask you for forgiveness. I'm choosing to turn from it 
and trust in your finished work on the cross. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and set me on a whole new path. Day by day and brick by brick, rebuild my life. Jesus, I want your best and I wanna help others in this journey as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on. We've got a team right over here that just wants to give you a Bible and pray with you. Church, come on, let's give it up for her one last time.